Anyway, um, let me begin by telling you that I think Ian Crichton was, was one of our finest writers. And though I'm as reluctant as he was to indulge in any sort of beauty competition mentality, I can say that I think he occupies a position that many Scottish writers take insofar as he is comparable with no one else. As Eddie Morgan said of Burns, there is no one quite like him. Ian's constant, almost cyclical return as to his background, the places where he lived and to the people, to the ordinary circumstances of the wind, the rain, and a woman coming home from the shops. It will be possible, I believe, to construct a picture of post-war Highland life from details in the writings of Ian Crichton Smith. The stories we're looking at today do not cover anything like the range of Ian's work, which would be difficult. But it's worth saying that in many of the stories, he uses his background and individual circumstances as a springboard into fiction. And rather than speaking directly, they carry a kind of invocation of what he was thinking. We're going to look at six of Ian's stories, and the first of them, The Red Door, comes from a collection called The Village, which was published in 1976. It's a series of linked stories set in a community that's similar to what I imagine it would be like either living in or growing up on Lewis, though the village is unnamed and changes size and appearance from time to time. In most of these, community, in most of these stories, the community is important. It's referred to directly or it sits like a kind of Greek chorus, commenting and informing. The collection breathes a slow measured life into a community that is behind the images of stasis and decay, alive with tensions, with inner voices and stark truths. These stories are clearly concerned with the many aspects of insular, Scottish life, the personal tensions that simmer beneath a social veneer, the claustrophobia, the routine, gossip, emptiness, conformity, paranoia and sheer bloody paralysis that comes from a need not just to conform but to be seen to be conform, to, to conform and then obviously to hold or to pass judgments on those whom you consider, like Ian, who do not conform. It has to be said that in this they resemble small-minded communities the world over. Remarkable thing to my mind is that many of Ian's stories are rarely judgmental, if hardly ever judgmental, at least not directly. Rather, they try to understand, even in the darkest, most miserable circumstances, they reveal what I think is a simple rule of storytelling, that choice is an act of sympathy. The Red Door is a story almost without plot, and it shows how Ian could create a story of insight and development from the simplest idea. Murdo, who features here, of course, is Ian's alter ego, and he pops up in a number of in stories. Indeed, there's a small collection of Murdo stories, all based on what I think is his best piece, a wonderful story, perhaps too long for consideration here, but I would urge the full-length Murdo upon you. <laughs> everyone, <laughs> everyone in Murdo's village has a green door. Murdo wakens one day to find that his door has been painted red. And not just red, with all its obvious associations, loose and political, but painted very lovingly red. And is now the only red door in the village, or as far as he can tell, possibly the only red door on the island. On the face of it, this is a scandalous act. <laughs> Murdo, for example, has heard of a blue door, but he's never actually seen one. But the scandal, you see, has an interesting effect. 
For this simple act changes murder's life, giving him a new sense of belief and of self-belief, evincing in him admiration and a certain childlikeness, leading him away from easy conformity through a new and purposeful door. There's no anger. It's only puzzlement. Murdo wants to fit in, to be as like the other villagers as possible, but this new door releases something in himself that had been buried for years, for he had always, even in his dress, been a villager and had never been himself. This is, and I quote, a magic door out of the village. We'll look at another a very different story from this collection later. Now, Ian openly acknowledged that his mother was a returning presence in his work and that she exerted a great influence on how he thought. I think it's fairly true to say that he felt sorry for her. She was widowed <coughs> when she was young and was left to bring up three sons and often had I'm sure he said this more than one interview that she had to borrow money from villagers with whom she felt she had nothing in common. She was very protective of Ian when he was young because he was quite a sickly child. And she, he made many sacrifices for her when she grew older. For example, there was a time when she was frightened to leave the house. And if she did so, Ian always had to accompany her. And if she couldn't go, he had to stay in the house with her. His mother's death was a devastation from which he took some time to recover. And this recuperation was instigated by Donalda, who later became his wife, and it heralded a new period of happiness, and I think it's true to say precipitated a new joy <coughs> in his work. There's a feeling that comes from a, an essay that Sorley MacLean wrote that Ian was a poet who wrote prose. But I don't, I don't actually agree with that because I think that some of his stories are so charged with an evocative imagery and that they raised sustained series of issues that we don't find in his poetry. For example... The Telegram has been fairly widely anthologised and is one of Ian's more familiar stories. Certainly, I think it's the most familiar of the stories I'm discussing today. I think this is because it fits into an idea of what a story does, that it has an almost predictable ending. Not quite the twist in the tale, but that its dramatic possibilities are extended so that when we reach the end, we can see tragedy, irony, or even pity, as well as relief from what went on before. Again, it's a village setting, but from the first line, differences are drawn, and the initial differences are physical. Two women, one fat, and one thin are the opening words. But within three lines, these differences are extended and given characteristics which are highlighted and developed later. Now, the premise of the story is very simple. It's wartime, and a Kirk elder dressed in black delivers telegrams to villagers whose sons have been lost. There's an interesting philosophical diversion here, something that I suggest you'll find in most of Ian's stories. He doesn't simply lay out the details the way another writer might, go through the essentials of character, voice, place, and so on. But he offers something else for you to ponder, as though it had just occurred to him when the story was being developed. Now, just after we're told about the war and the elder who delivers the telegram and the telegrams himself, he writes this, and I quote, that the villagers did not know what to associate it with, certainly not with God, but it was a weapon of some kind, it picked a door and entered it and left desolation just like any other weapon. I think that's great. I think that's wonderful. The idea of a telegram being a weapon might not have occurred to every villager, but it's entirely typical of Ian to suggest that it might. 
And no matter how much he emphasises the social and the economic differences. Remember, this is a story where one woman's cow ate another woman's washing, so there's a fair bit of antagonism going on here. <laughs> <coughs> it's the similarities that unite these women. For at the heart of this story is selfishness and reward rather than a shared grief or even a shared expectation of grief. Which is not to say that there won't be grief or sympathy for individual suffering, but their reactions leave no doubt as to where their sympathies lie. They're firmly rooted in self. These women love their sons, of course they do, but their love comes at a price. The story brings out the extremes of these women's characters. The thin woman has, in her own words, sacrificed herself many times to have her son educated. She's even gone as far as knitting a new pair of trousers for him. Something which I'm sure, is a, as far as I'm aware, it's a unique addition to Scotland's long hand-me-down tradition. <laughs> I've never heard of new knitted, not even seen knitted trousers. If anybody's got a photograph, please. <laughs> uh, nevertheless, it's a clear indication of poverty, making do where one dresses eccentrically out of necessity. But... It, soon's become, it soon becomes clear that this woman wants a reward. She wants payment. The English girl, her son, could, might even be seeing. Smokes and drinks. Can you imagine such a thing? Don't know what class she's in. And if he marries, especially if he moves to England, no one will look after her in her old age. And he surely will move to England, for there's a strong suggestion that a stranger, someone like herself, an incomer from another village, who isn't popular after all, she's only been living here for just over 30 years. <laughs> so another woman, especially from England, would not be welcome in this place. This is a closed community, and even though one woman does eventually pity the other, Nothing is said, for this is a place where people comment but do not communicate. Throughout the story, these women notice things about each other and sometimes say things as if they've seen them for the first time, but they do not communicate. And though Ian was rarely overtly political, there are references there if you look. For example... This story with something written in such a way that I think it suggests censure rather than strangeness or even irony. He tells us that two boys of similar ages who grew up together in a highland village, now that they're in the Navy, one has to salute the other. It's mentioned and it's left for the reader to pick up or to ignore. Again, as I say... Choosing is an act of sympathy. Now, the short story, as I'm sure you're aware, is a very subversive form. Images have to be sharp and characters have to arrive fully formed rather than be given time to develop. And nothing in a short story, especially I'm suggesting one of Ian Crane Smith's short stories, nothing is ever placed there accidentally. And nothing is hidden. The clues are all on the page. At the heart of these stories is a fundamental irony that is both tacit and implicit, but it's as fine as any Ian openly developed. These stories are written in a clear, almost simple fashion, and this simplicity, I think, takes us to the heart of the matter. Ian's writing implies that for the reader, language can be taken for granted. Now, what we're witnessing is a variety of character struggles with the impossibility of communication, that no language or description can adequately fit their experience. In most of these stories, there's a lot that's unsaid. There are silences and there's a lack of communication, undercurrents rather than misunderstandings, acceptances rather than struggle, though the acceptances, of course, often bring struggle. 
by using direct, understandable language, Ian is mirroring the world as in characters in habit, teaching us, urging us, I think, as readers, to beware of becoming trapped in our own language, that we do not inhabit a world of private meanings which we cannot communicate. Which brings me to the story called Mother and Son. It's an uncollected story, published in Aberdeen University magazine Alma Mater in 1949, when I think Ian was still a student. Immediately we can see, as soon as we look at it, we don't even need to read it, but as soon as we look at it, we can see that it's different from the others because the date and when it was written, the time it was written, brings certain associations of style and maybe even content. For example, the opening paragraph, one paragraph is almost two pages long and gathers information that writers of the time considered to be necessary for a good story. Before we can go anywhere, there's information that the writer feels he must impart. The stage has to be set. So we're given detailed descriptions of the man, of the place, and his mother. But it's the way that this is presented, I think, shows the writer that Ian would become. Threaded through this opening paragraph are details of a man lighting a lamp finding the matches, teasing the wick, the flame taking hold, and illuminating a miserable kitchen. At the end of the story, there seems to be a slow realisation rather than actual attainment. And there's very little narrative, for this is more a character study than it is a story. In fact, it's a study of two characters and how one can wear down another whose loyalty, or it may be circumstances, put him in a position to treat this tyranny with kindness. Just as one of the women in the telegram looks for rewards, spending herself on a son that she now never sees, there's an entirely different relationship at stake here. The mother, as I've said, is a tyrant, though she sacrificed nothing She expects devotion in return. She's been bedridden for ten years and is presumably ill, though her son has doubts. And there's an interesting psychological detail that is threaded through this piece. One would not think of this woman in this place, her son scraping a living that leaves them on the borderline of poverty. One wouldn't expect such a woman to be narcissistic. But it's there, and it's very plain to see. In all that she has to say, her every thought and action are selfish in the extreme. She doesn't even like her son and has sacrificed nothing for his benefit. Rather, in return for giving him life, she expects servitude. Her son can't work because he has to look after her. But she says he would be unfit, too useless to work, and questions his every thought or action. But his uselessness didn't come from her side of the family. (laughs) Our husband's family were the mob. That was them that had something wrong with their heads. And she always looks on him as her husband's son rather than her own. Which leads one to wonder how the lad was conceived at all. (laughs) The product, perhaps, of a single act that was so awful it would never again be repeated. (laughs) Or, what were the circumstances of his birth? And these are details that take us beyond the usual portraits of low self-esteem. The mother expects nothing but her son's malice. And though he hates her and would wish her dead, she takes pleasure from this. She likes this. She's enjoying it and actually taunts his weakness. The ending that I referred to is ambiguous and that's in a way that Ian's stories rarely tease. The mother falls asleep with a bitter smile on her face. The son has a similar smile, but he turns away and opens the door (coughs) 
and stands <clears throat> listening to the rain. Just as the lighting of the lamp at the beginning of the story carried what I think is a clear suggestion, perhaps the opening of the door rather than the shared smile is similarly suggestive. It seems to me that this son loves his mother and the realisation may very well be that this is no life for her as well as for him. Now, one of the simple rules about storytelling is I'm sure you're aware is that there has to be conflict. So writers have to ask what this character wants. Do they want love, revenge, respect, courage, a kidney for their daughter? Does she want the son she gave up for adoption when she was 16? If the character is like most people, he'll want more than one thing. Another truth of storytelling is that there has to be conflict, as I've said, is that there has to be conflict. But this conflict can come from the fact that people want to avoid something as well as get something. And the things that they want to avoid can be far more compelling than what they hope to gain. What scares him or her? Humiliation, disfigurement, pain, terminal illness, poverty. What will he or she do to avoid these things? And how did these fears develop? What have they done or are they doing to avoid these fears? Now, the stories in Church and the Crater are both set in the First World War. And both stories look at the monotony of battle. The Crater is concerned with a particular act of heroism. A small platoon attacks an enemy trench then the commandant leads the men back to rescue one of his men who dies in the attempt. It's packed with contrasting details. The horror of the trenches, the stink, the blood, the slime and the rats are quite graphically described alongside thoughts of God and the nature of the universe. It's told in a very matter-of-fact way, without much emphasis or exaggeration. But the simple statements make the point. For example, there was a full moon, so he stood up and carried the dead man across no man's land, rather than crawling on the mud and dragging him. And this heroism, or what the soldiers see as stupidity, is left again, as I say, for the reader to discover. The force of the opening of the in-church stories lies not in the things that we commonly associate with war, heroism and honour, or indeed their opposites. The force of the paragraph comes from what Lieutenant Colin MacLeod is trying to avoid. The protagonists of these stories are different people with different attitudes. And though the outcomes of both stories are entirely with keeping, in keeping with the narratives, their tone and the intensity of one story and the almost casual approach of the other suggest, or could suggest, that they're by different writers. We're told that Lieutenant Colin MacLeod is released for a short while from the war he wanders into a wood and has to turn away from a squabble where two birds are attacking another bird. He's looking for peace, for silence and a semblance of order. The church he finds in the middle of the wood is obviously Catholic. The church is deserted and looks as if it's been empty for some time. And such is MacLeod's innocence, for he's never been in a church like this before that he pulls back the curtain of what he thinks is a confessional, just to see if there's anybody in there. Again, the story involves two people and would be pretty straightforward, but for the question of what <coughs> someone wants. For both these men, the soldier and the priest, want the same thing. One feels threatened by the other, and does what is necessary, what he feels is necessary, to protect his freedom, even though it's not under threat. Along the way, of course, 
events are anything but straightforward, especially when the priest mounts the pulpit, reveals himself to be a deserter and delivers an anti-war sermon, which ends with an interesting moral dilemma, which once again raises the question of the role of the individual and what actions are justifiable to maintain personal freedom. The significance of the individual and village society and internal conflict is obvious from the opening of the story called The Painter. It's from the same collection that introduced us to Murdo's Red Door, but The Painter is different from the other stories we've looked at, or indeed different from most of Ian's stories, insofar as it's written in the first person singular. Excuse me. Now, I think this is significant. And I think it's, it's worthwhile considering the use of the first person singular as to why a writer uses it in the way that it's used. It's the first decision a writer takes and is often not aware of making since its influence is very often instinctive. It establishes mood and the tone of a story and narrows the focus by trapping the reader into seeing the action through the eyes of the character. It's also a wonderful way for a writer to insinuate detail. It's the one device a writer can do that does more than one thing simultaneously. It establishes character, background, place, nationality and class and is an obvious but quite a sneaky way of establishing the reader's confidence. It's difficult not to say boring within the scope and demands of a short story to make a character who has narrated in the third person say more than the scope of his action permits and to do so without implying the sometimes not too discreet intervention of the author. On the other hand, it is entirely legitimate for a first-person character to give themselves over to reflection, recollection, reasoning, philosophical meanderings, and so on. The craftiest of all, are those who employ the intimacy of a first-person narrative within a third-person narrative, marrying insight and detachment. And Scottish writers, I would argue, have become especially adept at the ways in which they use this device. Some get round it by using correspondence. Stream of consciousness is common, especially when dealing with the young mind or in establishing the problems of identity. As I've said, most of Ian's stories are in the third person, but his love of the fleeting, the coincidental, the fragmentary, the single image or the half idea that, as I've said, they appear to strike him almost by accident, as if it's unplanned and arrived when he was getting on with the other business of storytelling. These are the things that establish the intimacy. It's the details and the best of his stories, Murdo's a prime example, have most, if not all, the qualities of a first-person narration. He establishes a voice that is both intimate and sturdy. And when he moves into first-person narration, he does so for a reason. And that reason is usually to bring the subject closer. This story is narrated by a villager. William Murray was a, a young man who was liked in the village and his work was admired and still, until he stepped over a line he should have known existed, capturing an event of which the community are ashamed. The villagers bought his work when he painted local landscapes, pictures of dogs or sheep, or of local fairy tale scenes. But this had nothing to do with their love of art, nor indeed a desire to encourage young man's talent. 
They did this because his mother was poor, so it was a sort of charity. The incident that shamed him concerns a local bout drinker. A nice man, the life and soul of the village, hard working and good to his children when he's off the booze, but exactly the opposite, a rowdy tyrant and a wife beater when he's drunk. Pausing only to recognise the famed Caledonian twinning of opposites we find in everyday life, we are indirectly asked to suppose which is the real character and which the villagers preferred. For Red Roderick the drunk seethes with resentment towards his father-in-law. The wife he beats is poor and thin and has asthma. Furthermore, she's given him a brood of children whom he despises when drunk. But his father-in-law is almost 70, a fisherman who's admired and respected. And of course, they have a fight. But the battle becomes almost incidental, overtaken by something far more sinister when the nameless narrator sees William Murray recording the fight. He upsets the chair and destroys the painting. Consider the implications. If some outsider, someone from another village, even sees this picture, which is animated and therefore far more interesting than a still landscape or a sleeping collie, then what would they think of the village? The story presents a damning critique of village insularity and is all the more powerful because it's related directly by the protagonist who, in recollection, admires himself for what he's done. You may think I was wrong, she says, but it was the expressions on the other villagers' faces that made him do what he did. Please, sir, it wasn't me. After all, in other circumstances, these people are decent, law-abiding men. Now, in these stories, as well as the philosophical diversions I mentioned, you'll find contemporary, classical, Shakespearean references, which, like the political reference I mentioned earlier, are, 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 they're just simply dropped in and left. And though some contemporary references they may need to be interpreted. I think that along with other writers of his generation, Ian Smith has brought us to the position where Scottishness, and especially Scottish identity, is not defined in any narrow way, looking towards a series of ideas or symbols. Writers now know who they are and where they come from and can pick aspects of the past to investigate with or experiment without being trapped, for example, by place or language. Ian's ability to use a small town mentality as a source of humour and comic invention as well as a vehicle for exploring the human condition, has taken us to a place which is anything but obvious. In a history of, the astron of astronomy published in 1795, Adam Smith proposed that wonder is crucial for science and for the investigation of science. Astronomers, for instance, he argues, are moved by wonder to investigate the night sky. And wonder arises, he says, this is a quote, when something quite new and singular is presented and memory cannot, from all its stores, cast up any image that nearly resembles this strange appearance. If there's one quality that defines the work of Ian Crichton Smith, it is his continual sense of wonder. The fact that he is perpetually amazed by the ordinary. Who else could construct a poem about putting out the ashes or can define as much from a tin can on the beach as from a galaxy of summer stars? Thank you.